about one particular realization of hybrid systems. Uh, we heard today already uh, about the zoo of different hybrid systems which are possible. In principle, you can take any uh, of the quantum systems uh, on the market, uh, try to combine each, each of them, so any, any uh, combination uh, is possible, and one particular combination involves mechanical systems. And this is the focus of my uh, three lectures here. So, just to get the spirit once more, hybrid systems uh, are the attempt uh, to combine the strengths of different quantum systems and uh, to avoid combining the, the weaknesses of those uh, different quantum systems. And the goal is, in any case, uh, to perform maybe uh, quantum computation in the end with a quantum computer or perform uh, quantum communication or maybe on a more modest level to perform quantum metrology or in the end to just perform what Jörg also pointed out, what is most important to him, and I fully agree to that, to just do fundamental physics, to make like, large quantum systems, to see how far we can push uh, quantum mechanics uh, to the macroscopic level. Hybrid systems, as I said, uh, can involve any of the, uh, uh, the animals we have available in the zoo of quantum physics, uh, of course, ultra-cold atoms, ions, uh, photons, Solid state systems and these centers, as we have heard today, uh, semiconductor uh, structures, superconducting devices, maybe the most uh, uh, fa fastest uh, progressing systems at the moment, and not uh, last, uh, mechanical oscillators. So, if we talk about uh, mechanical oscillators, uh, our uh, the attempt in building hybrid uh, quantum systems is to combine them with microscopic quantum systems, maybe cold atoms or hydrogen vacancy centers. And here the uh, goal is to maybe use the toolbox we have available in the uh, AMO system, uh, um, in the AMO systems to uh, use them to prepare, detect, and manipulate the quantum states of mechanical oscillators. So to use AMO systems and the tools we have available there to gain control over these rather macroscopic uh, systems, uh, build quantum states of these macroscopic mechanical oscillators. On the other hand, we can use mechanical oscillators also as probes for uh, quantum systems, as probes, uh, new probes for um, AMO systems. So that would be uh, that direction here of that arrow. And in the end, uh, mechanical oscillators might have their biggest strength as transducers. Mechanical systems, and this is something I want to convince you about in, in, in uh, three lectures, mechanical oscillators have the strength to be uh, able to couple to essentially all of the AMO systems we have available. So that's really unique uh, to mechanical oscillators. And in the, in the end, maybe uh, mechanical oscillators are not so good as maybe storage devices, or we will not be able to build quantum computers purely out of mechanical qubits or something. But mechanical oscillators can maybe uh, uh, serve as a bus between different quantum systems. All right. So my uh, lecture will uh, lectures will consist of these uh, three parts here. In the first one today, I will mainly talk about optomechanical systems with no hybrid, almost no hybrid aspect uh, in, in that first lecture. Uh, the hybrid aspect will uh, come in in the uh, second two, and I will also mainly talk about coupling of mechanical oscillators to atomic systems. I will touch upon uh, the possibility to couple to other systems uh, uh, only briefly. And I'm aware that uh, in other lectures, maybe of uh, Gregory Fuchs, uh, we will hear more about uh, uh, coupling of mechanical systems, maybe, maybe to nitrogen vacancy centers. And um, also in the talk by, by uh, Marcus Aspelmeyer, we will hear uh, more about um, auto mechanical systems. So the first lecture will be an introduction, an introduction to optomechanics. 
Then uh, I'm going to talk about my mechanical oscillators here. What I have in mind are structures like this. So this is a, a, a drum, essentially, a silicon nitride membrane in some frame here. And you can imagine that uh, if you look at the formal modes of uh, such a drum, what you will find is essentially a discrete uh, spectrum of uh, resonance frequencies. And associated with each of those resonance frequencies, you have a particular eigenmode, which is the displacement field associated with that particular mechanical resonance. The overall displacement field associated or characterizing the uh, uh, fluctuations, mechanical fluctuations, fluctuations of this drum here, is given by the sum over all those discrete uh, eigenmodes here. And then we have here the eigenmode associated to each of these frequencies and a particular ampli amplitude here. So the time and space variables are separated in that way. So that is in complete analogy to what you would do in an optical cavity for the optical field. Right there, we would also uh, write the electric field as a superposition of the eigenfrequencies with a particular uh, eigenmode uh, set by the geometry of the problem and the time-dependent amplitude. If we pick out one of those resonances, and this is essentially uh, <coughs> What, I will go, what, what I'm going to do in the, the rest of the, the three lectures here, to pick out one of those resonances, then we can look at the equation of motion of this uh, time-dependent amplitude, and this will behave just like a harmonic oscillator. This harmonic oscillator will have this uh, particular uh, eigenfrequency omega here, and it will have an effective mass, which is somehow related to the actually uh, physical mass moving, yeah, given essentially by this eigenmode here. I mean, it will not be identical to the, to the uh, mass of the, of the overall uh, membrane, but some <coughs> fraction of it. So it's an effective mass, but in, in any case, it will be a harmonic oscillator. It will not be uh, isolated harmonic oscillator, so these resonances are not of infinite Q. They have a finite width and that is associated with a certain damping rate. And of course, along with damping, we will always have fluctuations. That is this uh, external force. This damping and these fluctuations can have many reasons. One uh, is that the eigenmodes, the formal modes of the, such a structure always couple to the frame where there are other formal modes. So just as in an optical cavity, <coughs> the intracavity modes uh, the photons in the intracavity mode can have a certain probability to leave the cavity and couple to the outside globe. And the same thing happens here. There could be other sources of, of that width as well, so uh, defects in the, in the structure and so on. Um, but we lump everything together into an effective damping rate and an effective external force, which of course also depends um, on the temperature. <coughs> so in the rest of the talk, and uh, the other lectures as well, I will focus on one mode of such a structure. Think of uh, such an engineered mechanical resonator here, where we try to uh, make a very uh, broad spacing between the eigenfrequencies and, and have a very uh, large cube. If we build such a uh, mechanical oscillator out of a surface which uh, maybe has a very high reflectivity, we can use uh, this structure as an end mirror of a fabri barreau cavity. And then we have the prototype of an optomechanical system. So we have here one of the eigen electromagnetic eigenmodes of this fabri barreau resonator, and we have one mechanical eigenmode of this uh, non mechanical non-mechanical structure. <clears throat> and if you would like to write down the Hamiltonian of uh, such a system here, then we simply have to add up the energies. So we take the energy of the uh, optical mode here, that is h bar omega of the cavity, a dagger a, the number of photons, plus h bar omega mechanical b dagger b. So I 
uh, get rid of the uh, zero point energy, of course, of, of these two harmonic oscillators in the end. Now, if the mechanical oscillator here moves, it changes the length of the cavity, and by the change of the length of the cavity, we change the res res resonance frequency of the cavity. So this cavity frequency parametrically depends on the displacement of this mechanical oscillator. That is, of course, a certain approximation. So that assumes that this mechanical oscillator is not moving at relativistic speeds. So actually, it's, it's some sort of, sort of born Oppenheimer approximation, where we say that the, uh, assume that the cavity frequency uh, adiabatically follows the slow motion of the mechanical oscillator. And that is a, a pretty good um, approximation. Now, we can even assume more. We can assume a small displacements of this mechanical oscillator. So we just take into account the first uh, uh, order in the Taylor expansion around some equilibrium position. And if we do that, <coughs> so we expand the cavity frequency around some equilibrium position, we find a linear correction which scales like the ratio of the cavity frequency over the length of the cavity. So that is just due to the fact that the cavity frequency itself is inversely proportional to the cavity length. And if we put this first term here, uh, so this Taylor expansion, in at the point, we arrive at this uh, prototypical Hamiltonian for an optomechanical system. So we have the energy of the uh, cavity, the energy of the mechanical oscillator, and we have such a cubic term here, which depends on the displacement of the mechanical oscillator. And now here, I measure the displacement xn in terms of the uh, characteristic length scale of this mechanical oscillator. These are the zero-point fluctuations of the mechanical oscillator, the root of h bar over 2 m omega mechanics. So I, I measure the displacement in terms of this dimensionless operator xn times eta by a from before. And what we find here is a frequency g0, which is the cavity frequency and the ratio of the zero point fluctuation to the length of the cavity. And this uh, g0 here, this frequency, is uh, the strength of the radiation pressure interaction um, of that cavity mode with the mechanical oscillator. So please uh, stop me uh, if I'm too fast, or also stop me if I'm too slow. Where, if you have questions, where just... Where do we get the zero point fluctuation from? Well, uh, here we have the physical uh, position right. of the oscillator. And now I just uh, define uh, oh, okay. x as the zero point fluctuation times this dimensionless okay. uh, operator x m. So whenever I am going to talk about the position of the oscillator, then I always refer to a dimensionless operator here. And if you want to know the, the real physical uh, position or amplitude of the oscillator, you have to multiply by this. So, so if you now take and say you have done an oscillator which has many, many, many different modes. Yes. So each of those modes would also couple the same way to the cavity. Yeah. And you think, oh, the only way to distinguish them is, is by their frequency. No. I mean, the frequency would be one thing, and the other thing is, of course, that uh, in a real system, geometry would enter. Because uh, if you think about uh, um, really using that mirror here as an end mirror for the tropical uh, cavity, then using, exploiting the, the, the um, aim modes of, of the oscillator, you can avoid coupling maybe to some asymmetric mode, and you couple only to the fundamental mode. So in this, in this G0 here, actually geometry uh, enters, and some mode overlap uh, between cavity modes and mechanical modes. Um, and yeah. So you can exploit geometry to uh, set it. But it's true that uh, this, uh, the fact that you have multiple mechanical modes is a notorious problem. So the signal that I get out from the comp that I get out has all the information. If you have a comp, yeah. yeah. I mean, if you're clever, you can make a large spacing, but in principle, you will always see more than one mode. Yeah. But I will keep things simple and talk about one mode. I'm a theorist, I'd love to do that. <laughs> <laughs> so I mean, how, how isolated does this mode have, have to be? That depends on uh, what you want to do. 
So sometimes it uh, it matters. Some um, sometimes it, it doesn't matter. And in, in principle, the, the, the rough answer is that I mean, you just as in the case of the of the optical cavity, you will have a certain free spectral range, and you have to make sure that whatever um, frequency is relevant for what you are going to do, it has to fit into that free spectral range. All right. So I, I was uh, talking about such fabry uh resonators here, where you can have this very intuitive picture of a moving uh, end mirror attached to some spring. And actually, optomechanical systems come in a very, very broad range and, and uh, a very broad range of physical realizations. So that starts with um, these very small uh, cantilevers used in atomic force uh, microscopy. Um, pioneered by uh, Baumeister, and this goes up to uh, the macroscopic mirrors hung on fibers in LIGO gravitational wave uh, interferometers. Uh, so that gives you a flavor of the range which we can have here uh, of mechanical frequencies, effective masses from picogram to kilogram scale uh, in that distance. In any case, Q factors can be tremendously now. And, uh, go up to 10 to the 7. So that is really uh, tremendous. And this is also, the, the I think, I believe, the, the reason why this field of automechanics really took off uh, in the last years. I mean, Pierre <coughs> wrote papers about automechanics, I don't know, 20 years ago? Uh, 30, 30 years ago? <laughs> at a time where, I don't know, no real automechanical systems were uh, realized. Not well, we beat one in Gerson. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah, the, uh, there were experiments done by a graduate student. We sacrificed a graduate student <laughs> in the best German tradition. <laughs> and, and it was really a mirror hanging on a wire. And that was the problem because the frequency omega m was kept yeah. hertz. So now it's see a huge massive. problem. Yeah. But he did get to see by stability. Okay. So the, in theory, the. And he, he was not completely sacrificed, now he's on the board of Zeiss. That's not, that's not bad. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so theoretical studies uh, really go back 30 years ago, but it's maybe in the last five, ten years or so uh, since automechanics really took off as an experimental thing. And this, I believe, is, is mostly due to material advances uh, improving on these uh, factors here, on the quality factors, so that is the ratio of the mechanical frequency to the limit of the uh, oscillator. So it just tells you how many oscillations this thing does until uh, the amplitude dies out. So 10 to the 7 is enough. But there are many more realizations. So I showed you these uh, uh, cantilevers with, with mirrors attached, and then uh, Jack Harris uh, proposed these micromembranes, which are uh, now ruling the field in, in the optical uh, uh, systems. So uh, that membrane here is not a very good mirror. It has a reflectivity of 30% uh, or so. The, it's just a nanometer, a uh, few nanometer thick silicon nitride membrane. So it's a piece of glass, very thin. It's one of these drums. Drum modes I, uh, I, I explained to you before. But you can put it in uh, a standing wave field of a Fabry-Perot resonator. And because it's much thinner than the wavelength, you can choose whether to put it on the nanti-node node or somewhere in between. And you can imagine that, depending on where you put it, uh, this thing will shift the optical path length of the fabry barrow resonator. So when it oscillates, it moves, it still shifts the cavity frequency. This is what you need in order to uh, achieve that radiation pressure coupling, which I explained to you on the example of the moving end mirror. But the, the Hamiltonian, which comes out if you uh, really properly uh, uh, de describe such a system, the Hamiltonian will look just the same. Of course, in G0, you will have different things entering. Again, mode overlaps and so on. Please. And how much does this thing absorb and how much does it transmit of the thing as well? The light is not reflected. So the, the um, uh, absorption of these membranes can be really exceedingly low, so 10 to the minus 5. And, uh, so you can really have systems where you uh, have a very good fi finesse, limited 
by, by the absorption of the membrane, true, but still very high finite steadiness. So you ignore absorption basically in your approach? You can ignore it in, in, in first. The, the very, very absorption hurts is that um, it will heat your system, so you will have some effective temperature, which is uh, somehow connected to the circulating power in the cavity. So that is where, where, it, where absorption hurts again. Another more exotic realization of what the mechanical system of these multiple radar structures, so you maybe all have heard about whispering color remote uh, optical resonators, where light is confined in such a uh, uh, micron-sized structure by total internal reflection. And of course, these systems also have mechanical modes. And um, you can imagine that if uh, su such a, uh, a formal mode changes the geometry of the structure, you will also have a, an effect on the frequency of the whispering gallery modes, uh, cavity modes in this system. So even though it looks very different, it realizes the same physics, is described by the same uh, Hamiltonian in the end. More exotic structures, optomechanical crystals. So you know about uh, photon, photonic crystals where light is confined by drilling holes uh, in, in, a, uh, in such a structure, and uh, those holes will shape uh, the, the bath structure for the electromagnetic field confined in this system. And you can build cavities in that way, you can build waveguides and all, all kinds of things. And by the same mechanism, drilling holes, you also shape the formal band structure. So if you do it in a clever way, you can confine also a formal mode at the same point where you have your optical uh, photons confined. So Oscar Painter is the one who pioneered uh, this uh, sort of setup. And you can imagine that for the same reason as in the microtoroids, we'll have coupling between those two uh, degrees of freedom, phonons and photons. We can have atoms in optical cavities, and they play maybe a similar role as the, as the membrane I showed to you before, that would be um, optomechanics with BCs in cavities. We can also trap. I just um, want to say, as a, as, as a Swiss person, I resent you saying that Esslinger is a contact. Oh, no. Oh, okay. <laughs> 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 it's not true. <laughs> Com copy and paste uh, mistake. <laughs> I'm sure I showed this slide uh, already a dozen of times. <laughs> 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 Um, okay, so we can also trap um, much larger things in, in cavities. We can take uh, nano uh, spheres and trap them optically in, in a cavity, and then we have uh, again something like a membrane in the middle, but now it's just a sphere trapped by, by light. So far, I was talking about optical fields coupled to formal modes. You can, uh, we can also have microwave fields, so we can uh, look at electromechanical structures. Um, so one realization uh, would be an LC circuit, where in the capacitor we uh, engineer or we engineer the capacitor such that it is able to uh, swing like a membrane. Uh, and if you change the, uh, the, the distance here between the capacitor plates, you change the resonance frequency of the LC circuit that realizes the same physics in a very different uh, uh, regime, our microwaves. We can have transmission lines coupling microwave photons in and out, and we can have very efficient detectors, so we can do the very same uh, thing. So these are two systems from the Cleland group and from uh, Teufel, uh, John Teufel, two holes, uh, groups here. And also, just a side remark here, uh, one can build hybrid systems out of these electromechanical systems where we take one uh, optomechanical or electromechanical uh, oscillator, uh, so a mechanically uh, moving capacitor here, uh, the LC circuit I was explaining about, and uh, here we take a, a qubit, some superconducting uh, qubit, Josephine Junction, and uh, we can easily couple uh, these systems uh, in the microwave region. So, 
Again, to summarize, we have this zoo of uh, optomechanical and electromechanical systems spanning uh, this regime from uh, the suspended um, uh, macroscopic mirrors and gravitational wave detectors all the way down to uh, cold atoms in, in optical cavities. And here I list uh, a nice, uh, give you a nice list of, of uh, reviews uh, on by Pierre in the Nanda the Physics from last year, and also I think this review of modern physics finally appeared <coughs> uh, last yeah. month. Uh, yes, it did. Yeah. So I should update the reference. So it's yeah. December 2014, okay. after one year of review. What oh, is that right? It must be the most quoted non published paper with the most missed citations. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's supposed to be. <laughs> All right, so let's go back to the more quantitative description of these systems. I tried to uh, motivate this Hamiltonian, which is describing the, the physics of such an optimal mechanical system. So the, the, the bad thing about this uh, nice radiation pressure coupling is that it is very weak. So if we put in an example here, so again, this G0 is a heavy frequency, uh, which is good if we work with optical fields, so that's a large number, but then we have this embarrassingly small ratio of the zero point fluctuation to the cavity length. So if we take a really, really short uh, cavity of 10 wavelengths, then uh, um, mirror this phantom uh, um, nanogram effective mass and megahertz uh, resonance frequency, the zero point fluctuation would be on the femtometer scale. And that makes uh, this ratio really, really small. Yeah. And we end up with G naughts on the order of, of 100 hertz. So here uh, I take one of the pictures of this review uh, in, in uh, reviews of modern physics where you see G naught as compared to the cavity line width. So that is an important parameter because it tells you how much one zero point displacement of the mechanical oscillator changes the cavity frequency on the scale of the cavity line. Yeah? So if, if that uh, ratio G naught over kappa would be one, that would mean one phonon completely tunes your cavity out of resonance for a given laser drive. And typically, these values are small on the order of 10 to the minus 4, 10 to the minus 3. There are few reaching that, and these are called atoms. So, then, is it good to have bigger G naught uh, for kappa? Is that well, that would be that would mean a total drastic uh, um, um, loss of the phonon. Well, a very nonlinear quantum mechanical interaction. So one would tune your cavity out of resonance. So that would be an extreme nonlinear interaction. Would be very interesting, yeah, but unfortunately uh, not, not reached so far. Unless with, with cold atoms, but of course with cold atoms you can do a lot of magic. So the, the, one of the, the nice uh, things or the interesting things about, about auto mechanical systems is, is that these mechanical oscillators are really large if we compare it to cold atoms. Yeah. They are macroscopic in a sense. They are micron sized structures, but still, I mean, they're macroscopic on, on the scale of uh, the systems we are used to in, in AMO physics. So then, uh, this ratio of G0 over kappa is typically uh, small. But still, let's uh, think about for a second what this uh, radiation pressure interaction would do. So let's take this Hamiltonian and uh, derive from it equations of motion for our degrees of freedom. So we take now the cavity annihilation operator, which you can always think of as the amplitude of uh, the, the cavity field here. We take the commutator with H, and we get the equation of motion in the Heisenberg picture. And what we see here is that of course, uh, put in from the very beginning that the cavity frequency is changed by the displacement of the mechanical oscillator, and that also means that we change, in other words, the phase of uh, maybe a coherent amplitude we have in the cavity depending on the displacement of the oscillator, and uh, change is proportional to this uh, interaction, T0. On the other hand, the mirror itself. Well, it's an oscillator, so it will oscillate, oscillate x dot is uh, omega 
p and p dot is minus omega x. Remember that we are working with dimensionless variables here, so we measure position in this zero point fluctuation in position, and we measure the momentum also in the respective zero point fluctuation of the momentum. So these are dimensionless operators. And the momentum here gets a contribution proportional to the number of uh, photons in the cavity. So that is a momentum kick. Uh, the photons impart on the oscillator when being reflected um, of that. And this uh, kick has also a strength of G0 per photon. Now, this is a very weak effect, so uh, what we can do is we drive the cavity and we can drive with a particular frequency omega L here, which we can choose as uh, in, in uh, relation to the cavity frequency here and uh, this detuning of the laser frequency from the cavity frequency I call uh, delta. And if we drive the cavity with a, uh, a field strength E here, then the cavity field will develop a large coherent amplitude alpha, depending on the strength of my drive. And it will, uh, to zeroth order in G0, be given by this external drive E um, over kappa plus i delta, the detune. And now let's take this equation of motion to some sort of mean field expansion. So we take in this interaction here only uh, the first order term in, in alpha. So then the field amplitude alpha uh, will get a displacement linear in xn and proportional to g naught times alpha. So that just means we sit on the um, the pole here of, of, of that circle. So we just look at the tangent and look at the linear displacement in the phase of the cavity field. We can do the same thing on the side of the, oh, the first let's take this equation and write it in terms of the field quadrature. So that is the amplitude quadrature and that is the phase quadrature of the field. They behave like harmonic oscillator with respect to the laser frequency, so the phase of the cavity field is drifting with respect to the laser frequency at this rate delta, this is what, what these two uh, terms mean, and then we get a linear displacement uh, proportional to g naught times alpha uh, and to the displacement, the amplitude of the mechanical oscillator. We can do the same thing uh, on the side of the mechanical oscillator, and here, instead of the proportionality um, to the number of uh, photons here, we would have uh, proportionality to alpha times the cavity amplitude. So the mechanical oscillator would get displacement proportional to g naught times the cavity amplitude times the amplitude fluctuation. So now we have two oscillators essentially coupled in a linear way, but now much stronger. Uh, we have now a coupling which has, has strength g naught times alpha. And alpha is the uh, square root of the number of circulating photons. So that can be a, a tremendous, uh, tremendously large number for even for uh, weak uh, driving fields. So just to give an example, for a milliwatt of uh, drive uh, and a megahertz line in its uh, cavity, alpha squared would be on the order of 10 to the 11. So we can easily crank up the effective radiation pressure in direction by a factor of 10 to the 5 or 10 to the 6. And in that sense, get a very strong effective interaction. G, the product of G0 times alpha, and this G can be on the scale of the mechanical frequency or the cavity line width, and uh, would result in, in strong coupling effects like normal mode splitting, etc. So it's this uh, set of linear equations of motion I will focus essentially in all of my three lectures. One can also think about the nonlinear version of optomechanics in the limit where g naught really becomes large. That is a very interesting theoretical topic, but as I said, it's uh, out of the scope of uh, present experiments. So let me focus um, on that. And well, you can say these are two linear coupled postulators. Um, that's very boring, but I will spend essentially three lectures now explaining <laughs> the physics of, of this system. So it's really somehow uh, magic what is uh, hidden in these innocent uh, looking equations. Just uh, to add uh, a remark to this set of equations, we can now go back and ask 
what Hamiltonian would give rise to, sit to this uh, sort of uh, equations of motion? And the answer is uh, this Hamiltonian. So we again have the energy of the cavity, I'm the mechanical oscillator, and now instead of this cubic interaction proportional to G0, we have now a quadratic term uh, position of the oscillator times amplitude operator for the cavity field times G, this uh, enhanced coupling strength. So this is the linearized radiation pressure uh, interaction. All right, so far I was talking about this, uh, that this system as if there was no decay whatsoever. Of course, uh, the cavity has a certain bandwidth, and uh, the amplitude, uh, amplitude uh, operators and phase operators uh, decay at that rate, and uh, they will see vacuum noise uh, coupling into the, the, the cavity, or even maybe also thermal noise, if we are talking about microwave systems. And also the mirror uh, is a finite uh, Q oscillator, so we have this damping and thermal uh, forces acting. And this is now the complete uh, description of, of that system. Now, for the cavity fields, as long as we are talking about optical fields or microwave fields at, at cryogenic temperatures, we can safely assume that these are uh, vacuum forces. So these are just vacuum fluctuations of the, of the field. But for the mirror here, for the mechanical oscillators, we typically really have to be serious about these forces being thermal forces. And the reason is, as we already discussed this, this morning, that um, this number of, uh, mean number of thermal uh, phonons in thermal equilibrium for a given temperature is almost always larger than one. We would have to go to a cryogenic temperature of, let's say, 100 millikelvin and to a, a you know, 5 gigahertz uh, oscillator in order to be really in the ground state. Please. In PC dot, or PM dot, what happened to your alpha next to the G? Uh, the, the alpha is absorbed into the G, so the, the G uh, is G oh, sorry, times alpha. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. So with G, I always refer to this uh, mean field enhanced uh, radiation pressure. So again, uh, in order to have a mechanical oscillator in the ground state, that simple passive cooling of its frame, of its surrounding, by putting it in the fridge, we take the best fridge, go to 100 millikelvin, and then we would still have to take a 5 gigahertz mechanical oscillator to be in the ground state. And 5 gigahertz oscillators, gigahertz oscillators exist, <coughs> this is really difficult. Uh, I mean, <coughs> Cleveland uh, is able to do that, but uh, in these sort of structures, you will not be able to go to gigahertz. That is typically in the, in the megahertz uh, regime, and there, even for the 100 millikelvin fridge, uh, we are at, at levels of. 10 to the 3 or so for the thermal occupation and the room temperature we are just way above ground. Okay, so that is uh, one uh, that was a unique uh, feature of, or one special feature of this sort of quantum systems that by nature or even in our fridge, they are not at the ground state. All right, so. Let's look at, at these linearized equations of motion. I just collect them uh, once more again. Uh, we have uh, as, as important uh, parameters here the detuning of our laser from the cavity frequency, which we can choose. We can uh, choose also the coupling by tuning the power, uh, which we use to drive uh, the system here. So remember that G uh, is proportional to the intercavity amplitude. We have the mechanical frequency, which is more or less fixed for a given uh, system, the line width of the oscillator, and the line width of the cavity, vacuum forces, thermal force. Now, the first thing uh, we can ask uh, when we see such a system, a uh, coupled system, is is it stable? Similar like uh, the, in the case of trapped uh, ions, we can make a stability analysis of this system. So. If you take a vector of these canonical operators, uh, then of course we just have this linear system. We have a matrix 
of coefficients, which we read off from these equations of motion. We have some inhomogeneous terms, which collect the noise forces driving the system. And then, in principle, we can solve this uh, system easily. <coughs> and the homogeneous solution would be just e to the mt times the whatever uh, the initial uh, uh, condition was of that system. And the system will be stable only if this homogeneous part of, of the solution does not explode. Yeah? Otherwise, uh, yeah, we will, we will, our linearized description will not be correct. Yeah? In order to, to be able to describe the system with these equations of motion, we have to require that these initial conditions die out. And that means that the real part of the eigenvalues of this matrix M all have to be negative. Otherwise, it is instant. So we can look at uh, some sort of uh, stability diagram of this system. And uh, I just mentioned here that, it is a, that there is a very powerful tool to evaluate whether the real part of eigenvalues of a particular matrix are uh, negative, and these are these root holdings criteria. So of course, we can evaluate the eigenvalues directly. Um, and, and look at the inequalities resulting from this condition, and we will prove its criteria to that in some more subtle and efficient way. You can look it up on Wikipedia. I don't want to go into detail here, but uh, the result is, in any case, uh, this, namely that for detuning of our laser below the cavity frequency, our system is stable for a certain range of optomechanically coupling G. At some point, if we drive the cavity very strong, we <coughs> can run into a region of instability. We can drive actually on resonance, but we are there very close to a region of instability, which covers essentially the whole region of blue tuning laser frequency above the cavity. So when we study optomechanical uh, interactions in steady state, we are bound essentially uh, at first to this region. Please. So uh, this is very interesting. So I sort of feel like I understand uh, the little region up there, it might be tuning with high power, but what's the physical intuition that I should have for why all blue detuning is unstable? We will come to that. I will come. Uh, so and there. also, is this Curve, uh, does this curve change um, depending on if the oscillator, um, as we said, like the oscillator is very close to its ground state? Um, no. Are we assuming that? That's, that's independent of the, of the state of the oscillator. That's really just a, uh, so even if the a statement about, about this set of equations. Really <laughs> this is a classical result. This is a classical result, yeah. It's so if, if the oscillator was not behaving, like if we were at room temperature and the oscillator had, was classical, even then it's <coughs> Yes. Yeah. That's a completely classical statement. So I, regarding your question, no, uh, I will sorry. come to that point and, and it will be come here. <coughs> All right. Well, let me add that, that I uh, recommend uh, this paper by Claudio Dennis, uh, a very nice uh, collection of, of this uh, sort of uh, logic and explaining it. What what does G in units of in the previous G uh, in, in uh, units of the mechanical. I mean, this, of course, I, I certain assumptions go in there, uh, and, and this shifts a little bit the space diagram. Um, for example, you have to choose um, how the cavity line width relates to the mechanical frequency, and that is here is shown in the resolved sidebend limit, where the mechanical frequency is larger than the uh, cavity line width. It looks a little bit different if the opposite is true. Also, uh, I show you this in the limit of a very narrow mechanical line width. And this is for a high Q oscillator always true. So if you have a megahertz oscillator and you have a Q of 10 to the 6, your uh, mechanical line width is a hertz. So it's really a vanishing time scale on, as compared, for example, to the cavity uh, uh, line width, which is typically also in the megahertz or maybe 100 kilohertz. Job. So, if you would have a, a mechanical um, 
uh, damping, which is much, much larger and not in the, in the Hertz region. So you have a very low Q oscillator, then you would have a certain region here also on the blue side, which as will become uh, uh, clearly. But that is kind of a generic feature. All right. So let's assume for the moment uh, we uh, uh, are in that, in that region here. And let's look again at the uh, <coughs> dynamics of this system. And let's rewrite everything in terms of creation and annihilation operators. So I just take the canonical operators, x and p, and uh, define the b and a for the mechanical oscillator and the cavity. So I, I put here this delta to make it clear that we're looking here at fluctuations around a certain mean position of the mechanical oscillator and around a mean amplitude of the cavity. So, uh, if we uh, use that language, our linear equations proportion look like this. And again, uh, the Hamiltonian, before I wrote it in xx, and now I uh, write it uh, in terms of a plus a dagger, p plus b dagger. We'll come back to that point, just to remind you of that. So, let's look at these equations of motion in a weak coupling unit, where this optimal mechanical coupling G is smaller than the cavity alignment and also smaller than the mechanical frequency, which is uh, a, a generic uh, region again. And this is the equation of motion for the cavity amplitude. Let's try to get perturbative treatment, uh, perturbative in this coupling G. So we now look at uh, G over kappa or G over omega m as small parameters. So we want to solve now uh, or get an effective equation of motion for the mechanical oscillator correct in a certain power of G. So let's put in this equation the zeroth order solution for the mechanical oscillator. And to zeroth order in G, the mechanical oscillator is just oscillating at its frequency omega m. So we write delta B here as some slowly varying um, um, amplitude operator times this fast um, oscillation frequency. We put that in here, and then we solve this differential equation in first order of G. And what you find is, uh, is this so-called adiabatic solution of the cavity field. So here the cavity fluctuations will follow the fluctuations of the mechanical oscillator, the B and the B dagger with these uh, pre-factors. Uh, and of course, we will have vacuum norms. This solution for the cavity field we can put in our equation of motion for the mechanical oscillator. I remind you of uh, this here. And if you regroup terms, what you find is an effective equation of motion for this mirror. Delta B dot is delta B times something. And here we have the original line width and the original frequency. And this is now shifted. We have a new contribution, capital gamma and delta omega. And this comes from these terms here, where we have delta A proportional to B and B dagger. And if we plug these things in here, of course, we uh, get terms which look like uh, this first factor in this equation of motion. So we get an optically induced damping and an optically induced frequency shift. On top of that, we will have a radiation pressure noise acting on the mechanical oscillator and the thermal force. So again, that is optical damping, and this optical damping depends on the radiation pressure interaction and depends on the laser T-tuning from the cavity, and it typically has uh, this shape here, again shown in the resolved sideband limit. So on resonance, this uh, shift in damping is zero, and below resonance, we get a positive dip, and Above resonance, we get a negative. We also get an optical spring, which looks like the derivative um, of, of this uh, curve for the optical damping. And that uh, already explains why we are unstable, essentially, on the blue side, because there uh, our damping, mechanical damping, gets uh, shifted to the negative, and that maybe changes the sign of the damping and makes our dynamics unstable. Uh, sorry, why do you call this a spring? Uh, yeah, so this is just terminology. So it's it's an optical spring because it, uh, it's, it generates uh, 
um, an effective screen for this mechanical oscillator. So there are experiments uh, uh, performed with um, mirrors hung on fibers, as, as you did, which essentially behave like free masses with very, very low uh, uh, resonance frequencies. But now you can put it, uh, you, you can shine a laser uh, from the left and the right, and you can increase the, the frequency, uh, the track frequency essentially of, this, of these mirrors um, by orders of magnitude uh, just using this optical track. Uh, that's why, why it's called optical spring. Because you, you add a, an a, a additional spring to this uh, mechanical spring. It, it's terminology. Sorry, I'm not a theorist, but in, uh, for the past two years, I always used to think that you take the cavity omega, and then you take the mechanical oscillator omega, and the optical spring, if you try to write down the math, you get a new effective, uh, a new effective uh, quantum particle that you can call the optical spring. But is that not the way you should look at this, or is that the wrong way? I'm not sure I understood the question. So uh, you take the photon and the photon. <coughs> And the optomechanical interaction acts like a new effective quantum particle. Is that wrong? Polaritons. Ah, polaritons. Yeah. Okay. <coughs> it's slightly different. I mean, this is in the in the weak coupling. Maybe in the strong coupling regime, in terms of normal modes, it's, it's a good way of thinking in, in terms of these polaritons. Uh, um, but but here, I mean. My uh, intuition for that is really that, is that you add an additional sort of harmonic confinement to your uh, mechanical oscillator, which is given by the optical of uh, course. So, I mean, so when I look at this, this is extremely reminiscent to me of auto oscillators. Um, in my background is in like magnetism, so spin torque. You put a spin tor current through a magnet. In, in the right geometry, it looks like you have the damping. You can say that that's unstable, but what it does is it just brings up your oscillator, yes. and then eventually it reaches a limit site. Yes. Do you get the same yes. type of behavior here? Okay. You do. Not in that description, because we are using a linearized model, and the limit cycle is not linear physics. But uh, you do get the physics, and you can also look at the quantum um, uh, dynamics around these limit cycles. Very interesting topic. I will uh, not cover it not hybrid. <laughs> <laughs> but there are a couple of, of very interesting papers on, on that. On, on there. What is big omega? Um, where is big omega? In the second block. Ah, here. Uh, that, is, um, that should be lowercase omega here. So that is just the, the this shift delta omega. I'm sorry for um, not changing that. So depending on, on how we choose the detuning here, we can choose um, the, the effective damping of the mechanical oscillator, and we can also tune the uh, frequency uh, to a certain degree. In the case of uh, micromechanical oscillators with large resonance frequencies of megahertz or so, this shift of the mechanical frequencies is typically very small, and you can neglect it. So look at the, the scale here. These are hertz. So we don't really have to care about that. You can imagine situations where you start out from an effective free mass, like a, hung, a mirror hung on fibers, and then you can really generate a large uh, trap frequency, these optical forces. But like normally, uh, for high frequency oscillators, you can uh, for completely forget that effect. But the optical shift in the damping can be really significant. So that is uh, like several dozens of hertz here. Again, in the example of a megahertz oscillator with a Q of 10 to the 6, the natural gamma is a hertz, and then you can shift it by several orders of magnitude, and obviously you can change the sign. Please. Maybe this is a silly question, but sort of this optical spring, I understand in a similar way as sort of this first interaction of light with atoms. Yes. yes. Excellent. But also when I interact with with atoms, then I have uh, the radiation pressure force. Is this also present here? That there is a, actually a radiation pressure force on the on the optomechanical or on the mirror, and that is this. I mean, on resonance, the, the radiation pressure force is larger than the dispersive force in, in, in the atomic system. And will it be the same here? So I would say that. Um, 
one, one can draw this analogy, but I would restrict the analogy to the off resonant case in the atomic system. So writing the, the atomic system on resonance um, has no sort of equivalence in the, in the optomechanical context. Uh, because then you really enter the nonlinear regime of, of, of the two level system being driven by light. But if you go off resonance and you stay sort of in the linear. Uh, but it's getting causes it relatively universal, right? You, 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 you revert the momentum of the photon so that that acts, of course, on the <coughs> Well, in, in, I, I think in that respect it's, it's equivalent, yes. And how does this compare in size to the... To the oh, that, to the can be, that can be the same order of magnitude. I see. Okay. So that uh, will become uh, clear also later when I, come, when I talk about the hybrid systems, is that uh, these this, uh, Gs, which we can have here, can be really uh, comparable for uh, a cloud of atoms, but even in high finesse cavities for a single atom. So it can be, the, the, the automechanical coupling can have the same strength as the uh, uh, light matter, uh, light atom interaction in the dispersal. All right, so <coughs> this coupling of the mirror to light has uh, this effect of optical damping, optical spring. Of course, we have additional noise acting on the oscillator, the radiation pressure noise, and we have the thermal force uh, unchanged from before. <coughs> so, as one of the first um, applications, let me talk about uh, optomechanical ground state cooling. Let's, <coughs> let's, let's tune our laser to this spot here, where we have a large uh, additional damping of the mechanical oscillator. So that would mean we tune our laser to the frequency minus omega n. And if we rewrite our linear equations of motion, now for the particular minus omega n, so these uh, equations of motion look like two oscillators which are now resonantly uh, coupled, so they have the same effective resonance frequency. And one, the mirror, coupled to a hot reservoir, it resonantly couples to another oscillator, which is coupled to a very cold reservoir. And if you can imagine that if you crank up this coupling here uh, sufficiently, then this mechanical oscillator couples stronger to the cold reservoir than to the hot reservoir. If you're doing a good job and have a strong coupling, you possibly can take this uh, oscillator to the ground state, even so it couples to the hot reservoir. In this respect, it's very similar to the results I can Yes, yeah, it will, it, this very same picture applies, and I will come back to, to that. So it will be, in the end, the same story as the ion cooling we just heard uh, in the book. So in that limit, uh, again, the mechanical oscillator um, has an increased damping, and I put in now this uh, uh, nice uh, spot here, and then this additional damping has the strength g squared over the kappa. <coughs> Of course, we pay a certain price, we add radiation pressure noise on that mirror. So also from this cold reservoir, we, we, we uh, have some force acting on that mirror. And we can take this equation of motion here and solve it in steady state. And what you find is that the mean number of phonons uh, in this system now contribute, has two contributions. One from the radiation acting on the oscillator, of course, uh, the uh, mean number of phonons has contributions from those two forces. That is the contribution from the radiation pressure noise. That is the contribution from the thermal noise. So it's a weighted sum, weighted by the ratio of the rates at which this oscillator covers to one and the other path. So the one rate is gamma as compared to the effective damping, and the other rate is g squared over kappa as compared to the effective damping. And then we have effective temperatures here, or effective number of phonons, the thermal uh, phonons, uh, number of phonons, and uh, some sort of effective temperature for the radiation pressure noise, which is given by the ratio of the cavity alignments to the mechanical frequency squared. Now, what are the conditions to go to the ground state, meaning to have a mean number of phonons uh, below one? The condition for that is 
as you can read off from this equation, firstly, that you completely suppress this last term here, and that means you crank up g squared over kappa so much that uh, this ratio of n bar over g squared over kappa uh, is much lower than 1. And this condition is just that this number c here, which is g squared over kappa, as compared to gamma times n bar, this gamma times n bar, is larger than 1. And this c here is nothing else than the strong, c, c larger than 1 just means strong cooperativity. So g squared is the rate of coherent coupling between the system squared as compared to the product of the sort of decoherence rates of the two systems. So cavity, dk, and the uh, uh, decoherence rate, the thermal decoherence rate of the mechanical oscillator. So for the quantum mechanical oscillator, the relevant decoherence rate is not the dk of the amplitude, which is gamma, which can be a very small rate, but the relevant me quantum mechanical decoherence rate is gamma times n bar. And n bar is a tremendously large number. To so the, the decoherent, thermal decoherence rate is much larger. And the product here is compared to g squared. The cooperativity needs to be larger than 1 in order to suppress thermal noise. And then in order to have then this first prefactor is 1. And if you uh, want to have this smaller than 1, uh, you need to be in a resource type and limit kappa smaller than omega m. So these are the two conditions for optomechanical ground state cooling as worked out by Ignacio Wilson Ray and Florian Marcotte a couple of years ago. And uh, this has been achieved uh, again uh, a couple of years ago, not uh, as long, it took a few years to, to actually do that. The first system uh, achieving that was an electromechanical system in the group of Conrad Lehner. So I explained you the physics of that. And here you see uh, the scale um, increasing cooperativity, that means just increasing drive strength, increasing G, and we start from a very narrow mechanical resonance, <coughs> and the area below that uh, uh, resonance gives you the number of phonons, in that case uh, uh, 27, and with increasing G, we broaden that resonance, we, we go to a very low Q oscillator, because we introduce this additional damping, and the area below that curve uh, is below 1. So that would be an oscillator uh, close to its ground state, with a mean number of phonons below 1. And that is an optomechanical crystal in Oscar Painter's group, achieving uh, the same thing, effective uh, occupation number below 1 for sufficient um, uh, photons inside the cavity, and that means for sufficient operativity. So uh, at this point where we go below 1, uh, the cooperativity would always be 1. Of 1 in the resource time limit, we are in the constant. All right, so how am I doing this time? Yeah, about now. So I don't want to keep you from, uh, from dinner. Um, let's see, let, let me show you these two slides and then I'll, I'll stop for the day. <coughs> so, uh, we can give an interpretation uh, to that cooling in terms of the sideband cooling of ions, which we heard uh, um, this morning. Uh, we can draw a, a similar level diagram as we had for, for the ions, where here we take the phonon number and here we take the photon number in the ions. That was the electronic, uh, the two electronic levels, so we would have a two-level system here and uh, the photon number would be the motion of the ion. And now this is the, the, the mechanical oscillator, and uh, here we don't have two levels. We have, of course, infinitely many levels, but still we drive, by detuning our laser by a mechanical frequency, we drive side and transitions, and then cavity DK takes us down. So we just climb down the stairs until we, we hit the border here where we have no transition going to the left. You can even understand the, the quantum limits to the side and cooling in that system or also for the ions in that picture because uh, you always have, even if you are in the ground state, you have this off resonant transition to the upper uh, uh, limit. This is off resonant, so you are detuned by 2 times omega m, and the line width of that level is kappa, so this explains this ratio of kappa over omega m squared, uh, which gives you a certain residual occupation of the. Of the 
All right, so let's go back uh, once more to the, to the phase diagram. Uh, again, we have here the region of stable dynamics, and now we can put in uh, an island of uh, the oscillator in the ground state here above a certain uh, threshold for the coupling strength, meaning in this number C here above 1, we go to the ground state. And uh, we can explain this uh, cooling um, on the label uh, at the end of this level diagram in the close analogy to, to I. Now, uh, in the next lecture, I will uh, focus on actually the unstable dynamics and show you what happens there. And uh, also on resonance, uh, and uh, uh, this is used for Zoe just, just to. to uh, at that, uh, um, the unstable dynamics here actually gives rise to entanglement, and on, on resonance we can do a position of force sensing, which gives rise to the standard function meaning, and this will be the topic of the, the other images. So, this is enough for the day. I take any question. Since we were talking about history a little bit, I wanted to mention one name, which is Braginsky. Yes. Braginsky actually had a paper in 67, which took me 30 years to understand, where he actually kind of said there should be cooling in this system. Do you know this paper? It's kind of, I can give you the reference. Is it it's in, almost is it in English? It's in English, Russia? yeah. But, but, but kind of. <laughs> <laughs> so that's why it took so long. But yeah, you know, you finally understand it when somebody else does it. Yeah, yeah. Well, I have the reference. Here. To be honest, I, I know that Brzezinski. Uh, he was a genius. He was a genius, and he developed many of these ideas we are maybe now rediscovering. That's right. Yeah. And uh, I, mean, I. But yeah, it was all classical. I don't read all, all of his papers because most of them are in Russian. And they are very hard to read. And they are hard to read. But this guy was an amazing guy. Is this the paper where the abstract ends and like there is a, there is this big uh, confusion whether radiation pressure will affect LIGO or not, and then the last sentence in the abstract is we have shown it does. I, I, will, I will show you the. Oh no, that's not the paper. This is the thousand case. Well, that's case. Yeah. 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 So the other questions? Can you explain the of the island of the visibility? Yeah, so here uh, <coughs> the coupling strength is given in units of omega m, and, and here we are above 1. So that is saying that we have those two coupled oscillators coupled stronger than their uh, resonance frequency. And that is where the region of strong coupling, where those two oscillators hybridize, and you have these polariton systems. And at that point, one of these normal modes of the system, so here we should analyze the system in terms of normal modes, not in the way I did it uh, so far. And uh, here in that island, one of the normal modes gets unstable, meaning the damping, effective damping is, is, is negative, or the effective frequency actually uh, is negative. That also is the <coughs> That's why if you tune in there, if you flip the sign, it would be tuning to make it positive. This whole thing is unstable from the get-go because right. one of your frequencies is nice. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So, no further questions in the interest of dinner. <laughs>